Hello everyone. I am super excited about today and extremely nervous about what I'm going to be talking about with you. But I'm starting a new series called Living with Anxiety and PTSD, um, Post Traumatic Stress Disorder. I'm going to give it a few minutes just to see if anybody hops on in case they want to see this um, live. There's my mom, my biggest supporter here. But um, no, I today I'm just going to be talking about my story, why I live life with anxiety and why I live life with PTSD. Some of you may know this and may have heard me talking about it. Others of you, it might be new to hear. Maybe you didn't know that I've been through this in my life. Um, but either way, I've never told it to you live. Some people have heard it in real life, but let me just start with saying that when I was preparing for this, I actually went in with confidence. I'm like, it's been... Well, since two that was March fourth, two thousand and eleven. So six years ago have passed since this happened, and I talk about it. I share this story, and I thought I would be okay. But I sat down to type the blog, and I couldn't. I couldn't do it. Um, that's the funny thing about anxiety and PTSD. It doesn't discriminate against who it happens to, and it shows its ugly head anytime it wants. So even though I thought I was ready to go and do this, I had way more emotion than I thought I was going to, and I'm sure it's going to come out if I start crying. I'm sorry. I'm actually not a crier either, so this could be interesting. So I see a few people on here. I'm going to just go ahead and get started. It might take a while if you have to hop on or off. If you stay the whole time, thank you. Um, I just want to share my story, and then I'm going to go into different parts of it later this week. But for right now, I'm going to share with you what happened and changed my life on March 4th, 2011. I was a new mom. I had a five-month-old. If you don't know who that is, that would be my daughter, Raylan. She is now six and a half and finishing kindergarten. But when this happened, she was turning five months old in two days. And I was like any other new mom. I was tired. I loved it, but it was exhausting. And we were just adjusting to parenthood, to being a mom, taking care of a baby, learning to enjoy my time while she napped. And let me set the stage for you. It was a Friday afternoon at one o'clock. It was a beautiful blue sky, no clouds in there, hot day. And Raylan was down for a nap and I was sitting on my couch. I had gotten some lunch. We had just gotten rid of cable to save some money. And I was sitting on my computer, probably chatting with my mom friend. Some of you are probably um, watching this right now, actually. And I was sitting there in the silence, enjoying my moment of silence, when my life changed. Um, this is going to be my side of the story. You're it, it, hopefully it makes sense. Um, you, ha you have to understand that this whole scenario happened in approximately 15 minutes, maybe less. So bear with me, try to keep that in mind as you're listening because it does change um, maybe how long things are happening for you as I tell this. So here I am sitting on my couch, just being quiet. I had my blinds closed. I, I wanted privacy. I just wanted to be able to take a nap in a little bit if I wanted to. And I hear my doorbell ring three times. And my gut instinct was, this isn't normal. So I picked up the phone. And I punched in 911, and then I go, no, I'm overreacting. So I decide to call Steve at work. And I call Steve at work, and as I'm calling him, whoever's at my door pounds on my door. Not like, like, twice. Well, that, two times. And I'm like, Steve, there's someone at our door, and this is not good. And he goes, I'm calling 911. Now you have to understand, Steve is at work in a different county. So Steve calls 911. They have to connect him to our county that our residence was in, which is also confusing because we had two addresses, so we always got the wrong one. So um, I go to the front door area, and our blinds were, it's a double window, and they had separate blinds. So I was able to peek out between the section of blinds without him ever seeing me. And I see a very giant man standing at my front door, and I'm like, this is not normal. But we used to get a lot of solicitors in our neighborhood, and I was like, well, maybe, oh gosh, maybe they're just trying to sell me something. And he starts walking back to his car. 
and I was like, Stevie's going to his car. So I ran upstairs, which our stairs were in the back of our house, away from our front door. So I ran up the stairs and looked out the window above our garage to try to watch this guy. And he bends down like he's getting in the car. And I'm like, okay, Steve, he's leaving. And remember, Steve's on the phone with 911 as this is going on. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to go back downstairs. And guys, I got halfway down my stairs. And I hear this asshole bust my door down. And I have a split second. And again, apologize for the swear words, but you're going to hear them. Because this is how my life happened. I hear this guy bust my door in. And I'm halfway down my stairs. I have a baby asleep in her room. And I go, what do I do, Steve? I said, the guy just broke into our freaking house. And he told me to get the gun. But in that split second, I had to decide if I was going to try to get a gun and fight this guy that weighed probably three times as much as me or go to my baby. So I chose in that moment to go into my daughter's room. I closed the door as quietly as I could and I locked it. And I go to the crib still on the phone and I pick up my little baby who's sound asleep and if you have a baby you know that when you startle them they usually start to cry and I go oh my god what am I going to do with this kid to keep her quiet why what am I going to do so being the logical person when somebody just broke into your house I shoved her in a tote go ahead go ahead and laugh about that I shoved her in a tote thinking I can put her in this little little tote it sounds so dumb now but it wasn't dumb at the time so, it, you know, it was like a little storage tote that you'd put clothes on. And I'm like, well, at least I can hide her. And if they take me, they won't get the baby. And then I'm like, Bray, that's the dumbest idea you've ever had. She's going to start screaming if she's in a tote. So I take her back out of the tote. And now I'm in the closet. And I'm, I'm like, okay, I'm going to try to nurse her to keep her quiet. Because what else am I going to do? And um, so I'm sitting in the closet. And I hear a lady named Sissy. Um, hopefully she hears this and sees this because she's still my hero. To this day, she's still my hero. She was with me during the hardest time of my life. And I'm sitting in the corner trying to keep my baby quiet. And I hear her yell, Steve, you got to go now. Now, mind you, Steve was probably 30 to 40 minutes away from my house. So what is he going to do? Nothing, but they, he knew he needed to come home. So he hands off the phone to this woman named Sissy, who is my hero. And I am talking to her, trying to keep Raylan quiet. She wanted nothing to do with nursing. But by God's miracle, this child made one noise the entire time, and it was very quiet. And all I remember talking to this woman about was saying, I'm going to die. They are going to kill me. They're going to kill my baby, and I am going to die. So I'm sitting in a closet holding my brand new five-month-old baby while some man invaded my house, and I thought I was going to die. And Sissy sat there, and she prayed with me. And she goes, you're not going to die. You're going to stay in there. You're going to be quiet. And you're going to get you're going to get through this. We're going to do this. And as I'm sitting there and she's reassuring me and I'm freaking out but not crying because I don't seriously like I don't really cry. It's not my thing. I kind of laugh instead of cry. But at this moment, I couldn't do anything but just literally feel like I was going to die. And as I'm sitting in this closet, I hear these men. There was two of them yelling and I knew they were upstairs and I'm what do you do? You're sitting there going, oh my God, holy shit, they're going to come and get me. And I hear them in my room, my bedroom, and then I hear him in my closet in, in that room. Um, the way our house was set up, the our bedroom closet, the master closet, backed up to where Raylan's crib was. So in her room, I could hear him in my closet and knowing that there was only a wall between me and this man was the scariest thing that I have ever done. And, you know, Sissy's just sitting there, you know, be quiet, be quiet, be quiet, be quiet. And I get a beep on the phone, and it's Steve calling me, and he's like, are the police there yet? And I said, Steve, I, no, I said there's somebody in our house, like, I can hear them, they're not here yet, I don't, you know, I don't know what to do. And he's like, okay, I'm going to call them back and ask where they are so that I can tell you when they're going to be there. So, you know, I'm still sitting there, somehow Raylan's being quiet, and I noticed that, it got quiet. And I'm like, Sissy, I think they left. She's like, don't you dare move, Lorraine. You're going to stay there until the police come and you will not move from that room. You will not answer the door for anybody. You will not leave until you know for a fact that the police are there. So we sit there and, you know, I'm like, I, I really, I, I'm pretty sure they're gone. And then I hear a knock on Raylan's bedroom door and I can hear a muffled yell. Um, there was a linen closet that would have been in between me and whoever was at the door. And I said, Sissy, somebody's knocking on the door and yelling. 
I said, I think it's the police. She's like, you're not moving. She's like, you do not get out of that closet until you know that it's the police. So I'm sitting there and I'm starting, not calm is not the word, but I'm like, okay, I really truly believe these people are gone. So I wait, Steve calls me back and he says, the police should be there. And I, t so I get back on the phone with Sissy and I'm like, Steve said the police are there. She's like, you're not leaving until they come, until they come and get you. And I hear another knock at the door and I'm like, Sissy, they're knocking again. I said, I'm gonna go check. And she's like, you're staying on the phone with me. I'm going with you. So I go to the door and again, me being who I am, I go, I heard them say they're the police. And I was like, are you really the police? <laughs> what are they going to say? No. So um, they said yes. And I opened the door and I said, Sissy, it's the police. I'm going to go. So I got off the phone with Sissy. And all I remember doing at that very moment was handing my child to a police officer and falling to my knees. I just needed to know that somebody could take care of my kid because I was incapable of it at that very moment. And I needed to just stop. I needed to breathe and go, oh my God, I just survived this. I'm going to be okay. And I just needed a minute to sit there. So once I gained a little bit of composure, again, still not crying, um, a shock, I guess. But after I gained a little bit of composure, I got up and we started the next process of this, which is going around the house and seeing what they did. So we started upstairs and we went, because I knew they were in my bedroom, so we went in there and I, right away I noticed that my TV was gone. And, but nothing, they, um, luckily in this whole ordeal they didn't tear through anything. So it wasn't messy, it just, well it was messy from us, but it wasn't messy from them. But I noticed they took the TV and because I knew they were in the closet, we went in the closet and um, I noticed they took our safe. It didn't really have much valuables in it, but it had our social security numbers. Uh, our marriage license and our birth certificates and the old setting for my wedding ring. What I did notice is he passed in my bathroom somehow. He did not see my engagement ring because it was too, I don't, I don't know why I didn't have it on, but it wasn't on there. And um, he passed that and I was so entirely grateful for that. But um, anyway, so those were the two things they took upstairs and I went and checked the third bedroom and nothing, that was where our computer was, but nothing was missing. And then we started to go downstairs and they're like, don't touch anything, you know, like just walk and don't touch because we're going to fingerprint and all of that stuff you see in a movie, it really happens. Uh, not maybe like the movies, but it does happen. So we go downstairs and the first thing I see is my living room and I, you know, I notice the TV is gone. But the funny thing I noticed is that they unhooked the Wii cord and set the like the part that gets your motion just like down. And I'm like, well, that was very nice of you to not um, injure that, I guess. And I noticed my computer was missing. And then the shock happened. I turned the corner to my front door. And the, the one thing that's supposed to keep you safe in your house, that you lock it and you lock your deadbolt, is busted open. There are wood pieces, sh like, thrown across my living room. Like, I'm talking the whole other, or not the living room, the dining room. And our dining room was huge. It was literally, like, thrown across the dining room because he kicked the door in. And, um... To stand there and see the, the security and protection that's supposed to keep you safe did absolutely nothing for you it is a moment of realization that your security was completely stolen for you from you and the things you thought kept you safe don't and what else couldn't I trust? That was my instant, like, if that can't be trusted, what, what else? So, um, you know, we... I, I remember, I don't remember the timeline right now about how this all played out because that all is very real and very um, raw, but a little bit of it gets confused. I remember, you know, there's police, there's probably like four or five police cars at my house. People are starting to drive in and out of the neighborhood and one of our neighbors who we were friends with uh, as a couple, um, he stopped by, the dad stopped by and he goes, are you okay? And I am not a hugger. I, I, I'm not, I don't, I'm just not. And the poor guy, I threw myself into him and said, I just need a hug. And we weren't that good of friends, guys. Like, we had hung out a couple of times, but we weren't that good of friends. And this poor guy just had a woman throw, him, throw herself into his arms and say, I just need someone to hug me because I just need to know I'm okay. And, you know, that he left. And then um, the neighbors across the street who became basically our second family after this happened, you know, they stopped to ask if we were okay. And I said, you know, now we are. And Steve's on his way. And, um... So I go back in the house, I think, and the police are asking me for my statement, for my questions. And we go stand at the bar in my <laughs> kitchen. 
And this is when I was pretty sure the police officer either thought I was in complete shock, like going to need to go to the hospital, or that I was the most insane person in the world because I stood there, he's asking me all these questions, and in the middle of it I go, hmm, at least he didn't eat my lunch. And the police officer looked at me like, you are weird. Like, there's something definitely wrong with you. But anyway, that was what I had to focus on. I had to focus on my lunch not being eaten because everything else in my life had just literally fallen apart. And that was something I could grasp and think was funny and laugh at. So he gets our state, he gets my statement, he gets my description of the man because I did see him. They do their detective stuff and uh, take finger, you know, look for fingerprints. And we found um, the tip of a glove, so we kind of knew there wouldn't be a lot of fingerprints, if any, because they did have a glove on. But they took that. Um, you know, they took our statements and said, if you see anything else that's missing, just call us and let us know. And, you know, Steve got home, and I, I've never seen my husband look like that before. I've never seen my husband so distraught and so just utterly helpless and, and just emotional. Um, I, I, I don't even know how to explain it, but it was the first time I'd ever seen that in him, and really the only time. Um, I, I've never seen that since. It, it's, it's definitely a once, you know, like a thing you can't compare to anything else unless you... I guess have been through it or have to go through it again but um he got home and he started on the the information part um taking care of like the the bank accounts and um, changing passwords and contacting the insurance company and all of that and you know I, I the police must have still been there again timelines kind of frazzled they were still doing their thing but I remember Steve being upstairs in that third bedroom working on the computer and I remember him livid like I'm talking swear words out the wazoo that I won't say right now in case your kids walk by but he was so pissed off at the insurance company and he's like it's nothing like their commercials because we have State Farm and he's like they just said okay bye and hung up on him and he was like what no I pay so much money you know I just I just remember him going insane and the funniest part is we walk downstairs after this and our, our agent standing in our living room and he's like oh it is like the commercials they just show up and if you know Steve and I you know that this is kind of how we deal with stuff we're very sarcastic and humorous and um, try to just enjoy life and even in the moments that are pure terror we still found some moments to laugh a little bit but you know a couple of neighbors stopped by um, a neighbor who was a police officer stopped by to check on us and I don't remember somebody came over and sat with us that night while they were fixing our door we had to have somebody come and fix our door and I know neighbors um, offered for us to spend the night at their house and you know we didn't know them that well and you want to be so tough in these moments you want to say you're okay and you're like no we'll, we'll be all right we'll make it you know none of our family could get there right away because um, they all lived far away, and I remember having to call them and being like, well, I don't want to tell you this, but I have to tell you this, and, you know, letting them know, and it was horrible, but we stayed home that night. We brought Raylan to bed with us, and we locked all the doors that we possibly could, and we had a shotgun with it. It was loaded under the bed. Um, I don't know what you think is going to happen, but it's just the way you respond, and neither of us slept that night. It was so terrifying to <laughs> To try to go to sleep in a house that was literally broken into and your door was on the floor is absolutely impossible. Um, so we didn't sleep that night. And the next night we did accept the offer to go spend the night. But let me just inform you that we lugged the loaded gun with us there too. Because no matter where we were, we didn't feel safe. It, our safety had been completely violated. And no matter where we went, it didn't feel safe anymore. And, um, you know, I'm starting here. You need to know where this anxiety and PTSD came from. And this is how it happened. Um, I, you know, I've had anxiety my whole life. I actually was always fearful that my home was going to be broken into. And I had a plan. I kind of had this plan. And guess what? I did it. I did it exactly like I thought I would. But... The anxiety was there, but the PTSD didn't come until after this event. And it was literally, to this day, the hardest thing, and still is the hardest thing, that I've dealt with and that I deal with on a daily basis. And, you know, 
I, the point of doing this series is one, to let you know who I am. Um, I'm way more than just this, but this is a huge part of me. And if you meet me now, you will likely notice that I am antsy. I, I don't like loud noises. I don't, don't you ever dare come to my house and ring my doorbell without letting me know or I'll probably punch you in the face. Just a heads up. Just text me or like knock on my door or something. But it's, that, that is a trigger and I can't handle that. But there are weird things. There's, I, I'm kind of quirky with it. There are things that um, have to happen in my life to make me feel safe. And it will never go away. Things have gotten better and we'll get into that. But if you meet me, this might help you understand who I am and why maybe I am the way I am. Um, the overprotective mom, the a little bit jumpy person. But this this is me. This is what happened to us. And, you know, please don't ever mention it to my children yet. They do not know Raylan would die. She, she would not survive and we'd be in counseling. And, um, so if you know me in real life, don't, please don't ever mention it to my children. They, we will tell them in time, but it, they are way, way too young for that. But this is the beginning. This is where my story starts. And there's a lot more to it, but we're going to break it up so that it's not so long and drawn out. So thank you guys for joining me. Um, thank you for all of the support that I've been given over the years that, you know, continues to come in. I, I love you all for it. And I hope that me telling this story can help at least one other person who maybe isn't dealing with a break-in, but is dealing with anxiety and PTSD and your story is important and your story is very real for you no matter what it is and I just I want to share my journey with you in hopes that I can help you and encourage you and be an ally for you during your journey but thank you guys again for listening and I hope you guys come back tomorrow to learn more about my story and my journey to life with anxiety and PTSD I hope you guys have a fantastic day and I will talk to you later bye